Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, CRISPR chip detection of unamplified target genes via CRISPR-Cas9 and mobilized on graphene biosensors. It is presented by Dr. Kiana Arand, who is the co-founder of NanoSense, an assistant professor of biomedical sciences at the Keck Graduate Institute and a visiting assistant professor at UC Berkeley. My name is Judy O'Rourke, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email following the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Oran. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, before I start talking about our technology and why we decided to combine CRISPR and electronic system, I would like to just talk about our vision and why we're interested in merging biology and electronic. With all the successful technological advances that we have had in electronic system and gadgets in terms of size, speed, accessibility, cost, if we can tailor this electronic system for healthcare application, we can really transform healthcare, in, uh, healthcare industry. Can we actually use this technological advancement and design simple and easy to use biosensors for healthcare application where you can have easy access to your health information? Now, if we can leverage the existing biology and existing assays and, we, and merge those with electronic biosensors, then we can bring this system to market much faster and really start using them. And if we were successful, then we can then we can scale, uh, scale this system that we can actually have a lot of people uh, use this system for their healthcare information, for their health information. And we can make the system more accessible without the need for um, a skilled personnel or a specialized space. In addition, if we're using digital system, you can, you can do multiplexing because, because uh, uh, because of the advancement in size of these systems that we have, uh, we have been able to, to get to very, very small sizes, we can design multiplex system on a very small scales. So that will allow us to, to, to process large volume of information and collect large, uh, large volume of information. We can also analyze the data much easier using the systems. So why is this important? It is well understood by biologists and researchers and scientists that if we want to really understand the underlying uh, processes of diseases, looking at a single biomarker is not enough. We need to look at proteomics. We need to look at genomics. We need to be able to process this data and, and make predictive analysis of why, uh, why these are important in, um, in disease uh, uh, processes. So if you think about it, you're going to have to deal with a large volume of data and uh, without digital platform, it's going to be very difficult to process this large volume of data, to actually send them to algorithm where they can be analyzed and predictive analysis can be made. So sensors and electronic sensor in that aspect would, would be very beneficial because we can seamlessly collect many data. We can seamlessly transfer this data to, to algorithms and analyze them and make, uh, make predictive analysis. In terms of nucleic acid detection, I mentioned that if we can leverage the existing biology, it would be, make, it would be easier to actually take the system to commercial application and real, uh, real use. But in terms of uh, nucleic acid detection, leveraging the existing biology and merging them with, with electronic is a little bit challenging. The reason for that is existing assay and biology, such as uh, next-gen sequencing or amplifications, are difficult to bring on uh, um, electronic biosensors and devices. Although we can address 
problems like portability, cost, speed, and multiplexing with digital sensors, we still have to deal with complex primer designs and some of these uh, amplification methodology, they require more than one enzyme. So that then we have to make sure that the, the assays that we're developing are are applicable for both enzymes. I mean that both enzymes can, can work perfectly in that environment. We have to optimize this assay significantly. Then we have to deal with reagent and we have to bring this reagent to our you know, biological systems. And we also have low, uh, low single base, uh, uh, say, uh, single base per specificity in this system. So there still be a lot of complexity if we're going to merge this system with um, with electronic devices, merge this assays with electronic devices. What really we really want, we want a real simple uh, system, very similar to the search function that we have in our computers. When you hit Control F in your computer. You can actually search for um, um, for any type of word that you're looking for. You just put that word in the search box, and the search function will search through your document, and it'll find it for you. And then you can edit or change it or do whatever you want to do with it. It's 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 that simple of a system that we're looking for. How can we design something that simple that that can help us design simple digital biosensors? something that, that can do the search function as simple as a control F on our computers. If you look at CRISPR, CRISPR is a two component system. It consists of a Cas uh, enzyme and endonuclease and a guide RNA. Together, this complex CRISPR can unzip the double-stranded DNA, search for its target molecule or target the strand, find it, and then it, it, it cuts it. And after that, we can do editing. So if you look at it, the main function of CRISPR, it's, uh, it's searching. The, the most powerful um, uh, aspect of CRISPR is its search function. It's very similar to the control of on our computer. You can actually program the guide RNA to find and search for any target molecules that we're looking for. So can we actually use uh, this biological search engine in our system. So if we can actually monitor CRISPR activity, we can, we can potentially design a simple system that utilizes the CRISPR search function and uh, find the target molecules that we're looking for. It is important that we take into account that the power of CRISPR as, a, as compared to other gene editing technologies it's, it's simplicity, because you can easily reprogram this, uh, this complex to target and find any uh, nucleic acid or uh, any sequence that you're looking for. So we don't want to take away the simplicity of this system. It's also a very versatile system because you have the ability to simply reprogram it by changing the, the guide RNA strand to target a different gene. So we really want to design a system that maintains the simplicity and harness the reprogramming capability of CRISPR and merge it with electronic. So in order to do that, the best systems are field effect transistors because these are, these are label-free system. If you look at the picture on the right, you can see how the system uh, look like. These are basically three terminal devices. You have source, drain, and gate. The current that you see here between the source and the drain, which runs through a semiconductor material, mostly silicon is used, it's, uh, it's controlled by the gate voltage. So now if you consider the gate voltage to be constant, the current, which is shown uh, as IDS here in this picture, depends on the semiconductor property, semiconductor electronic property. So now if you can uh, adhere or attach charged molecule uh, to this um, semiconductor and uh, you will change the property under a constant gate voltage, you'll change the property of this semiconductor. So the IDS or other electronic parameter of this transistor would change, which can be monitored without any labels and very quickly. So if we can bind our CRISPR complex to our semiconductor, for example, silicon here, and uh, monitor it, when it binds or it interacts with its DNA target, then we can monitor these activities because DNA is a charged molecule. So 
it affects the semiconductor property and the electrical property of, of silicon. So we can actually use the simplicity of the system and not, um, um, and not lose the CRISPR simplicity in our system. In addition, we can make millions of these transistors in a small space, in a single chip. So that will enable us to use the versatility of CRISPR, where you can actually functionalize each of these transistors to target a specific gene. So now you can actually have, uh, you can actually monitor different region in, 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 large, um, in large genes uh, using this multiplex uh, systems made of these transistors. Although this is a very powerful system, and uh, basically you have a label-free transistor label for label-free detection and CRISPR, but silicon material itself is not very sensitive. That means that we may not be able to see the interaction of the CAS uh, or the CRISPR complex with the target. In order to improve that, we use graphene. So graphene is a 2D material made from a single layer of carbon molecules. It is super sensitive to the molecules, especially charged molecules like our DNA or uh, like proteins that are attached to it. Or even if they come close to it, you will see the change in uh, electrical property. So if instead of silicon in our fill defect transistors, we use graphene, we can enhance the sensitivity of, of this system dramatically. So now if we can adhere our, our CAS enzyme to graphene, um, we can basically get the same property uh, as a silicon-based full defect transistor, but with significantly higher sensitivity. In addition, we can easily attach things to graphene. We can attach proteins, we can attach enzymes, we can attach nucleic acid to graphene, and then this, this protein or these capturing molecules, they, then they can interact with your target, which in our case will be immobilizing CRISPR on graphene and having it interact with DNA. And as the, the DNA comes close to the surface, then you can monitor uh, uh, the activity on the surface of the graphene. So this is exactly what we did. We combined uh, CRISPR with field effect transistors, and we made our field effect transistors from graphene biosensors, uh, from graphene material. So there's a video here that can show you how, uh, how the CRISPR complex works. CRISPR chip can detect the target DNA using a handheld reader developed by the team's industrial collaborators. The surface of the graphene material within the CRISPR chip transistors are decorated with thousands of CRISPR complexes that are anchored to the graphene using chemical linkers. After the introduction of the unamplified DNA onto the CRISPR chip transistors, these DNA molecules travel down to the surface of the chip where they are scanned by CRISPR complexes. CRISPR unzips the double-stranded DNA and searches for its target. If it doesn't find its target, the DNA is released without further interaction. However, if the CRISPR finds its target sequence, it will bind to the DNA. This binding changes the conductivity of the graphene material, which is ultra-sensitive to the absorption of charged molecules at its surface. This complex generates a signal, which can be detected rapidly with the CRISPR chip configuration. So just to recap on the video, we have our uh, CRISPR chips, um, which is decorated with, with thousands of uh, CRISPR uh, molecule on its surface. Once we introduce our DNA sample, and this is basically a DNA sample, not an amplicon, to our um, graphene surface in our CRISPR chip. If the CRISPR complex finds this target, then it'll bind to it. And this binding will change the, the electrical property of the graphene, which we can sense uh, immediately with our, with our reader. So here you can see how the chip is basically fabricated. You have, you have basically, again, a field effect transistor where you have your source and drain electrode the graphene is placed between the source and drain electrode, and then you have your gate um, um, terminal, which is inserted in the liquid. 
the way we fabricate the system, we used to purchase uh, graphene chips from, from commercially available vendors. We used to make our pattern it and make our transistors. And as you can see, then if you wanted to do multiplexing, we would have multiple of the systems connected to our, to our readers and we would read from them. Although this was very, uh, and these are very powerful uh, sensors and very sensitive systems, but the fabrication of them were very time consuming and it was not something that we thought it would be scalable. But later on, we started collaborating with our industrial partner, CardioBio, which they were specialized in mass fabrication of graphene chips. So we started using their graphene sensor and that helped us um, progress in our research significantly faster. So we had a system that was very close to a commercial uh, product. So the system, as you can see in this figure here, the graphene sensor is, is functionalized with, uh, with CRISPR complex. Basically, we have a linker molecule. The linker molecule is bound to our CRISPR complex, and then we introduce our sample to, uh, to CRISPR chip. Functionaliz the functionalization process is shown here in this figure. You have the naked graphene uh, in figure A. In B, we immobilize our linker molecule. The linker molecule has, from one end, binds to the graphene sensors, and from the other end, it binds to the Cas9 enzyme. In our case, we use the activated enzyme because we just want to bind. We don't want to cut the uh, sequence. And then we introduce our guide RNA. So the process is basically um, first immobilizing the graphene, uh, immobilizing the complex on the graphene. Then we passivate our, our chip to make sure that we don't have any naked graphene uh, surface left because then they can interact non-specifically with our, tar with our uh, biological sample. And then we, we calibrate our sensors and then we do, we do our measurements. The important thing is that with our readers and our, we have the capability to actually monitor these events in real time from the minute that we, we place our linker molecule on the surface from the, where we actually functionalize our, our sensors with the, with the Cas enzymes, passivation, binding guide RNA, and then interaction with the DNA. These are all can be monitored in our system, which enable us to do other applications, which I'll talk about later with CRISPR, with CRISPR chip, not only uh, diagnostics. So here you can see the sensor response in presence of Amplicon. So as you see in this graph, we tested our sensor in presence of uh, um, a blue fluorescence protein, uh, an Amplicon that contains blue fluorescence protein uh, uh, genome in it. So if you see in this, in this case, uh, the DRMP scram shows a CRISPR chip that was functionalized with a, with a CRISPR complex that had the guide RNA that was not specific to our blue fluorescence protein gene. Whereas the DRMP BFP was a CRISPR chip that was functionalized with a guide RNA that was very specific to blue fluorescence protein gene. And you see our sensor can significantly tell you that the binding and the sensor response in presence of the target was significantly higher than when you did not have the right uh, guide RNA. So this by itself will enable you to actually validate the guides. When, if you're using software to design your guides, then you can use our complex to actually um, see if the guides that you're purchased or the guides that you have are working on your amplicons. In addition, we tested our sensor with, um, with whole genomic sample. That means that there was no amplicon. We basically just purified genomic material and we tested it in our CRISPR chip. As you see, the sensor response was very specific to the concentration of the material that we introduced to the, to the sensors. So here again, we use blue fluorescence protein, uh, but this time we used the whole genomic sample that contained the blue fluorescence gene. And uh, after introduction, introducing the, um, the, um, the genomic material to the uh, CRISPR chip and washing, we can see that the sensor response also correlated with the amount of genomic material that we placed on the sensor. And this was done without uh, amplification. We also tested our sensor in presence and absence of um, uh, contamination. Here you see, uh, in this graph, you see when we test the sensor in presence of um, uh, a genomic material that did not contain blue fluorescence protein, basically very similar 
to the other genomic material. One had the blue fluorescence protein and the other did not have. And our sensor response was also, was also very good. We did a lot of chip optimization for these processes. This include efficient functionalization, buffer conditions, and uh, assay times. We did appropriate calibration. And also, we have to make sure that we used the right molecule to passivate our, our graphene uh, chips. However, we haven't done CRISPR surface, uh, CRISPR uh, mod uh, optimization where we can actually change the density of CRISPR molecules on our CRISPR chip to see how that affects the range and our limit of detection and limit of quantifications. And also, we can also further work with, with graphene geometry in our chip to enhance our sensitivity. We later on moved to actually use clinical sample to see how our sensor was responding in presence of clinical sample. We, for the first sample, we used uh, 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 genomic material from Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So the dystrophin mm -hmm. gene is the largest gene in human body. And uh, the disease can happen if you have deletion in any of the exon, basically 79 exon. If you have deletion in any of the exons between exon 1 to 79, then you have, you're prone to this disease. So what we did for our uh, CRISPR chip design, uh, we first obtained samples from patients that had deletion in exon 3. So basically, uh, patient A, B, and C had deletion that contained deletion of exon 3. Patient D, E, and F had deletion that contained exon 51. We designed two CRISPR chips. One CRISPR chip was targeting exon 3, and the other CRISPR chip was targeting exon 51. In this graph, you see the sensor respond. Uh, so this is basically a CRISPR chip that was designed to target exon 3. H1, H2, and H3 are healthy samples obtained from patients that did not have uh, uh, muscular dystrophy. And as you see, because this patient all had exon 3, the sensor response was positive. However, because sample A, B, and C were lacking the exon 3, the sensor response was negative. For sample D, E, and F, because this patient had exon 3 but did not have exon 51, we were also getting positive response. We had the sample D is, um, is a false negative, and it was also validated with um, uh, sequencing. The graph on the right now shows that CRISPR chip that was designed to target exon 51. As you see for healthy patients, H1, H2, and H3, and, and patient A, B, and C, which had exon 51, the sensor response was positive. However, for sample D, E, and F, because they were lacking exon 51, the sample, um, the CRISPR chip response was negative. For our threshold, we used the highest concentration of genomic material that you could obtain from a single buccal swab, about 2.5 microgram of, uh, of, uh, of genomic material that was non-target material. And basically, we designed our negative threshold based on that. In addition, we monitor, so the, uh, we monitor the chip reproducibility. So the, uh, the orange bar graph that you see on top here that shows the, um, the sensor response uh, and chip-to-chip -chip variation. And uh, we, we also did um, concentration uh, variation, and the linear response is shown in the graph here. So as you can see, for you can easily design a system that can target all of these 79 exons. You can have a multiplex transistor. Each of these transistors can target one of these genes or a region of these genes. And then when you run this genomic sample on our transistor, you can, you can easily identify which region of these exons are deleted for this specific disease. For, for, for genetically inherited disease, we actually do not need PCR. The system was able to actually detect this um, uh, deletion without the PCR. We understand that for many applications, you may need PCR, such as infectious disease, where you have very low concentration of your target. But for some application, you really do not need to run PCR. And that's one example of it. We are currently running an um, experiment with sickle cell disease. Sickle cell is kind of, uh, it's more difficult to detect because um, it's single point mutation. With muscular dystrophy, it was big big deletion, but with, with sickle cell disease, the healthy and disease uh, genetic material, they only differ in a, in a single single, uh, nucle single base. 
So uh, our our result here was in presence of uh, amplicons, and you can see here with, uh, when we designed a CRISPR chip that had that was the, the targeting the healthy uh, um, the healthy HBB uh, sequence, we were able to get high response in presence of the healthy samples. These are healthy amplicons from healthy patients, and. SCD1 and SCD2 were, were disease patients, and we're not getting a similar response in those, although there are single point mutation. And uh, if you had a scram guide, that, is, that means that if, was a, if you use the guide that was not a specific to any of these uh, target sequences, you won't, be, you won't get a significant uh, response. So uh, we're currently running the system on, on, on full genomic material, and we're also getting very promising results from, from the system. So as I mentioned, diagnostic is not the only application of CRISPR chip. You can monitor CRISPR binding efficiency. As I showed you, when you actually design your guides using the softwares, the online softwares, you can actually validate your amplicons. Instead of running gels and uh, gel electrophoresis, you can actually use our system, and this will give you a much quicker response if, you're, if your guide RNA is actually binding or, or cleaving or doing anything with your amplicons. We can also test the same uh, the same guys on purified DNA to, to see if the the, uh, the CRISPR complex that you're designing actually does interact uh, with the, with your DNA or whole genomic sample. In addition, we're really interested in monitoring CRISPR binding efficiency in chromatins because it's shown that Cas9 binding and cutting is really inhibited by chromatin. So if your target sequence is in a closed uh, regions of the chromatins, uh, you may not be able to, uh, to actually uh, find it in, in, in your chromatin structure, although your in vitro studies where you run them on amplicon or purified DNA might give you good result. When you actually um, go ahead and you run your in vivo experiment, you may not get good result because probably those target sequences are in your closed chromatin structure. So we're really interested to use um, uh, to use chromatin in our chip and see how uh, what kind of a sensor response we can get. And we can also use the system for monitoring other type of Cas enzymes because uh, or or Cas like enzymes because there's a lot of scientists and researchers are developing similar uh, enzymes to Cas that have different efficiency or they they may or they may not require. PAM-like sequences, so we can also use those uh, system on our on our you know, CRISPR chip. So I'd like to summarize my my talk with um, mentioning that combination of biology and nanoelectronic can really provide us with unique information about biological molecules and biological events in our body. Uh, with this system, we can actually enhance the frequency uh, of our measurement and get real-time insight to biological event. What are the enzyme activity? Because you, you can enhance the frequencies so quickly that you can actually see any of um, enzyme interaction and if they interact and release, or you can monitor those with electronic uh, systems. In addition, because in biology, we're usually dealing with charged molecules like proteins or DNA, with this electronic system, we have the ability to control the mass transport of this, uh, these molecules. We can bring them down to where to our surface where you have your capturing molecules like, like the Cas enzymes or the CRISPR complex and improve your efficiency because you don't have to rely only on diffusion in this system. And you can do this without any label, without any chemistry, which is really powerful. And uh, this system can really provide us with new information uh, which can help our understanding of biological events happening inside us. With that, I want to thank you for listening and acknowledgement to my lab members, my collaborators, and my support. And I would like to take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Aron, for that informative presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. As a final reminder, our speaker will follow up with any questions you've submitted via email. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>